From small screen flops to perhaps not getting the best out of landscape shifting technology, it's safe to say the Force was not exactly strong with these particular Lucas Forge Star Wars elements. Gareth the Hutt here from What Culture Star Wars, and here are 10 things that did not go the way George Lucas wanted. Number 10, the holiday special. In isolation, the concept of putting together a light-hearted holiday special, riffing on elements from a beloved franchise is pretty harmless, and even potentially a fairly entertaining endeavor if executed well. Just look at the success of Star Wars' own LEGO variety of holiday treats, and the understandable buzz surrounding James Gunn's upcoming Guardians of the Galaxy riff on the festive season. However, with high levels of anticipation can sometimes come a bit of a lackluster end product. Evidenced in this galaxy far, far away's first attempt to bring a bit of festive cheer to George Lucas's corner of the small screen universe. Absolutely destroyed by critics upon landing on CBS in November 1978, despite roping in the majority of the feature players from the smash hit that was A New Hope, Lucas's odd desire to have much of this TV Star Wars adventure center around Chewbacca's Wookiee family didn't exactly bear the sort of fruit he was hoping for. Outside of the animated introducing of instantly iconic bounty hunter Boba Fett, there's a reason Lucas has done everything in his power to distance himself from just about everything to do with this ill-fated special as the years have gone by. Number 9. Star Wars Underworld Long before Disney Plus were unleashing fresh new live-action Star Wars tales by the quarter on their streaming service, George Lucas set out to tell his own small-screen space-age story set between the events of Revenge of the Sith and A New Hope. Yet with this still being the mid to late noughties, the idea of throwing tens of millions of dollars at a project designed purely for televised consumption wasn't as widely accepted as it is today. So despite putting together some rather intriguing test footage that would later leak online in 2020 and dreaming up a potential 100 hours of content for the show, Star Wars Underworld ultimately didn't make it onto our screens due to budget concerns. Simply put, forking out two to four million dollars per episode was a pretty steep investment back then, and Lucas and Cole felt that it was probably best to put the entire project on hold until technology caught up and allowed them to produce the show on a smaller budget. In the end, though, upon being purchased by Disney, Lucasfilm opted to steer clear of Lucas's underworld branding when firing up their streaming service, and telling their own post-prequel TV tales seen in the likes of this year's Obi-Wan Kenobi. Number eight, midichlorians don't go down a treat. Instead of dropping jaws around the world and leaving fans feeling wholly satisfied at the revelation of microscopic organisms in the blood of all living things known as midichlorians, being the reason some folks can move rocks with a wave of the hand, the entire Phantom Menace exposition dump Qui-Gon Jinn delivers to a baffled future Darth Vader felt like a needless way of overcomplicating matters. Sure, it helped establish how ridiculously OP Anakin Skywalker was from the second the unorthodox Jedi Master stumbled upon the Tatooine lad, but the complete lack of midichlorian nonsense in the celebrated tales that would follow this table setter of a trilogy only further hammered home the pointless nature of adding some bizarre concrete science to this mystical way of manipulating the energy around us. And with many of the folks involved in bringing elements of the franchise into existence, like Death Star Legends author Steve Perry, also noting how the concept of midichlorians was less than inspired, it's clear Lucas didn't convince a great many that this prequel edition was in any way essential. Number 7, Han definitely shot first. As time would trickle on by, it soon became clear that a few seemingly innocuous beats housed within the likes of A New Hope were not to the creator's liking in the slightest. So on top of eventually stuffing a dreadful amount of clunky CGI into later special editions of his OG set of flicks, Lucas set about chopping and changing one specific scene involving everyone's favorite smuggler blasting an alien into next week. With Han Solo infamously firing first in his tense exchange with Greedo on Mos Eisley, Lucas quickly decided that he actually didn't want his lovable scamp to come across as a cold-blooded murderer so early in the Star Wars day. But his multiple attempts to reframe the moment by letting loose a surreal red laser shot from the green alien's blaster a millisecond before the eventual general does has only added further fuel to the Han shot first fire, and another hilariously clunky sequence to an already perfectly fine 1977 entry. 
Fury. Number six, an epic love story fails to deliver. It's evident that George Lucas had some rather high hopes for certain facets of his prequel trilogy, particularly the passionate romance between Anakin Skywalker and Padme Amidala that would prove to be the catalyst for the creation of the most iconic villain in the galaxy. However, what could have been a tragic tale of forbidden love ultimately wound up being remembered more for its highly memeable attempts to conjure up some genuine chemistry between two actors trying their utmost to make lemonade out of some of the worst dialogue ever committed to this galaxy far, far away. And oh boy, is that saying something. Perhaps even more tragically, looking back on the hours of behind-the-scenes footage available on these early 2000s adventures, tells the story of the likes of Lucas, Natalie Portman, and Hayden Christensen all very much treating the love epic with the sort of care and respect needed to give Skywalker's eventual turn the dramatic hoof it so desperately deserved. But all of the good intentions in the world couldn't save anyone from monologues about sand and shack frolicking in the fields of Naboo. Number 5. A more uncompromising Anakin Skywalker was not PG-13. George Lucas was under no illusions when it came to the birth of the unmistakable force that was Darth Vader in his prequel flicks. He had to be as terrifying and unstoppable as humanly or cyborgly possible. But that is quite a tough task when you're faced with producing a flick that has to fall in line with a strict PG-13 rating. And it led to Lucas having to slightly censor his diabolical fallen Jedi in the editing room. In particular, an infamous scene which depicts Anakin savagely setting the stage for the massacring of a number of innocent younglings was said to have been originally much darker, according to Palpatine actor Ian McDiarmid. And while McDiarmid felt it was probably a good idea to cut out the more gruesome version of the Order 66 scene, he did also recall a conversation with Lucas about the grisly cutting down of the next generation of Jedi. On the other hand, George says, That's what he's like, this guy. He's uncompromising. People should know it. But sadly, they weren't allowed to fully know it back in 2005. Number 4. Letting Ewoks Bring Down an Empire as already noted, Lucas's original trilogy is widely regarded as one of the most celebrated cinematic feats in movie-making history. Yet that's not to say that each and every component of this intergalactic machine completely clicked with the paying public out of the gates. In fact, the sight of a bunch of teddy bears taking down the Big Bad Empire that had been wreaking havoc on the galaxy for three films was divisive to say the least during Return of the Jedi. Lucas has gone on record to defend the inclusion of the Ewoks in the Battle of Endor over a previously planned Wookiee population by stating that they were merely a way of distracting the Imperial troops. But that still wasn't enough to convince most that these cuddly souls possessed the firepower to hold off the most advanced army of the time. In reality, the Ewoks were likely designed as little more than a way to appeal to the younger demographic and sell some stuffed toys upon release. But either way, they still sit as another of the rare opinion splitters in this generally cherished original trilogy. Number 3. Blue Screen Work Doesn't Mask a Lack of Soul Few would argue against the fact that George Lucas helped thoroughly change the game with his use of computer-generated imagery in the prequels. With his utilizing of blue screens and combining of CGI with practical costumes and sets being genuinely groundbreaking at the time. But for all of the mesmerizing digitally enhanced battle scenes, beautifully computer-crafted locales, and fully animated clone and droid troops seen over the course of the prequels, there's no escaping the fact that this reliance on the artificial over the real deal robs Star Wars of some of its heart. With the original trilogy of flicks regularly finding itself shooting on location or fully built sets, due to technology not giving Lucas the tools needed to digitally craft his own imaginary worlds, the planets we occupied and stories that were being told felt tangible and came equipped with a touch more soul. And while undoubtedly impressive in execution, the reality of actors being forced to exhaust their imaginations by constantly performing in front of little more than a bland blue background eventually led to a set of features that, while visually ahead of their time, felt unfortunately hollow. Number 2. Jar Jar Binks CGI Groundbreaker And speaking of CGI endeavors not exactly landing in the way Lucas would have hoped, what once looked destined to be perhaps the most important Star Wars development of the time quickly devolved into little more than a stick to beat the creator's precious prequels with. I'm of course talking about the controversial Phantom Menace debut of the first ever fully computer-generated supporting player in a live-action flick by the name of Jar Jar Binks. Blatantly designed to once again appeal to the younger demo, an admittedly impressive technological feat was very quickly overshadowed by the need to present Binks as little more than lazy slapstick comic relief. Despite all of the backlash sent the character's way though, Lucas defiantly stands by Binks being his favorite character in the series. 
saying as much when saluting Ahmed Best for his dedicated work in bringing the Gungan to life on set and in the recording booth throughout the flicks. With Hugh McGregor admitting to wanting to work with Best again in the future whilst promoting Disney Plus's Obi-Wan Kenobi, perhaps now may be as good a time as any to rehabilitate a CGI character in need of some desperate TLC. Misa thinks so very, very much. Number 1. The Sequel Trilogy Despite ultimately deciding to all but part ways with his galaxy far, far away in 2012, upon Disney's purchasing of Lucasfilm, George Lucas still found himself involved in the process of bringing the House of Mouse's sequel trilogy into existence, acting as a creative consultant during its early stages of development. However, as Lucas would later go on to confess in a conversation with Cinema Blend in 2015, pretty much all of his original ideas for the next trilogy of Skywalker saga flicks, and The Force Awakens in particular, were binned off early on. Later on, Lucas Lucas would frequently take aim at Disney's direction heading into The Force Awakens, criticizing the first entry's retro feel, with the sequels definitely going down a completely different road to the one previously planned by Lucas many moons ago. As revealed in the Star Wars archives 1999-2005, Lucas wanted to center the tale around Leia Organa's rebuilding of the Republic, with Darth Maul returning to train the new Darth Vader in the form of a girl known as Darth Talon. Aside from Leia acting as the leader of the Resistance in a supporting capacity though, it seems Disney had little interest in sticking to Lucas' initial plan for the stories that would follow his sacred original space opera trio. That ends our list. Know of any other things that didn't go the way George Lucas wanted? Let this Padawan know in the comments section right down below, and do not forget to like, share, and click on that subscribe button while you're there. Also, if you feel the pull of the force towards this sort of stuff, then head on over to whatculture.com and find some more awesome articles just like the one this video you're watching right now is based on. I've been Gareth from What Culture Star Wars. May the force be with you thank you very much for watching this video today and hopefully i will see your faces very very soon bye bye